Jesus said to his disciples, when the Son of Man comes in glory and all his angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne and all the nations will be assembled before him. And he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me. Naked, and you clothed me. Ill, and you cared for me. In prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill, or in prison, and visit you? And the king will say to them in reply, Amen, I say to you, Whenever, whatever you did, for one of the least brothers of mine, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you gave me no welcome. Naked, and you gave me no clothing. Ill and in prison, and you did not care for me. Then they will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or ill or in prison and not minister to your needs? He will answer them, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do for one of the least ones, you did not do for me. And these will go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So as I mentioned in the intro here, the Solemnity of Christ the King, which every Catholic throughout the world is celebrating today, is a relatively new thing. It was set up in 1925, so two years from now be 100 years. Relatively new, because obviously 2,000 years of history, that's relatively new, but still essentially important. And why did Pius XI named this a feast that all the church, no matter where you live, has to celebrate on this Sunday. Why focus on kings? Isn't that a thing of the past, right? Uh, I was going to go look up on YouTube or in Wikipedia, what are all the countries that still have kings? I know there's a few, right? Spain, England, Denmark, a few others, Monte Carlo, etc. But it's largely, at least from a governmental instrument, that effectively manages and governs people, relatively a thing of the past. But why did the Pope then set this up? He explained his reasons in the document that establishes Quas Primas. I'm only going to focus on one. He was observing the historical kind of aftermath of World War I and seeing that for the first time, at least in a long time, an atheistic country was being set up in Russia. Right? They were expressly anti-God. Right, the Bolshevik Revolution, etc. And he was, this was a first, right? That a people would organize themselves as a state on the fundamental value that God doesn't exist. And we will organize society in such a way that excludes God. And even proactively eliminate those who would propose it. <laughs> right? That was a new thing. And so he reflected that abandoning Christian proposal for how to organize society and indeed how to organize our lives because society is just a macrocosm of the individual moral choices that individuals make and small groups like families, neighborhoods, societies make is not the way to go. In fact, we propose we should order our lives and in some way all of society towards the ultimate truth of history where we're all headed, which is the throne of God in heaven. The reading that we had today in Gospel, I was asking myself, is this literal or figurative? But Jesus says, hey, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, so that's a historical event, the end of time, and all his angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne and all the nations will be assembled for him and he will separate them out. Sheep and goats, maybe that's where it starts to get figured. He will separate out the good from the bad. That's historical. 
That's Jesus saying, hey, this is how history ends. <laughs> Son of Man will come with his angels, and there'll be a judgment. We believe that. Final judgment, right? Everyone will experience their personal judgment at the end of their life, and then all of history will receive a final judgment at the coming of Jesus. This is their proposal, right? I was thinking of this also in relation to Thanksgiving, where the founding of this country, right, that the pilgrims explicitly left Europe and often left kings who had a confessional state, right? And they wanted religious liberty. They wanted the freedom to organize themselves according to their own values and not be imposed by whatever the faith of the king was. They wanted some autonomy, freedom, liberty, etc. And in fact, they did so. But when they began finally, after several hundred years of this experiment, to organize a government, they did so on, we all know, the Bill of Rights, right? That we hold certain truths to be self-evident. They're evident in and amongst themselves, right? And that God, the Creator, has given us, in creation, certain inalienable rights, rights that shouldn't be eliminated. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, right? And we hold these, these are truths that are pretty self-evident. We don't need to explain or defend them because they're clear. If we look at the way God has created the human person, they're free, right? They have the gift of life as they exist, and they should be free then to pursue their own happiness, right? Those were the values on which they organized. But inherent in those values is God. These are God-given rights that we as a society will respect, right? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So there's an implicit organization of society around what God has revealed through nature, through creation, through the human person, right? And we respect those, and we want to organize ourselves around them. Some people would argue against a Christian, explicitly Christian state where we say everyone has to believe Christianity. The church doesn't propose that, nor does it even suggest that. The church says religious liberty. Every conscience should be free to pursue belief. Right? We shouldn't limit that. Because God's given the human person freedom to pursue that. Now, at the same time, every, free, every religion should be free to propose its answers. To evangelize, to missionize, to share. And let free individuals choose and follow the Lord. In fact, that's what we believe. We believe actually that what we offer is actually good. And if given freedom to express it, not only in our personal worship, but in the public sphere, individuals can freely know it, learn it, and then choose it. And that's what we propose. In fact, as disciples, that's what we do. I believe it's a false belief to say, well, you could have an expressly public sphere where religion isn't present. Like, no, no, keep that private. <laughs> well, wait a second. If moral choosing should be free, then Moral choosing happens publicly, right? Not just privately, publicly, together as a society. Not just in my bedroom or just in my living room or just in my dining room table, but also when I go to work. It's because I'm a human being everywhere, right? Now it's in vogue, it's somewhat in vogue, at least understood correctly by their to bring your whole person, right? Bring your, that's the way we want to organize. Freedom to pursue the truth, and then that's incumbent on us as Christians then to propose the truth that Christ has given us. And that's what we want to do. Every society, every small group, every individual has to organize their life around certain values, right? You can't not have a value. Over Thanksgiving break, I made a little uh, day trip up to West Point to see the, uh, the museum up there and just uh, walk around a bit. And I was impressed with some of their core values. In fact, when they established West Point as a university for forming leadership in the military, it's around core values, right? We're doing this project because we're convinced of duty, honor, discipline, et cetera, country. These core values around which we're gonna form leaders, and we believe those leaders formed according to these virtues will be good for leading men, hopefully towards peace, but sometimes in times of war. Right? These values are important, and they're actually worth living for, defending, and if necessary, dying for. 
these values, right? And there are core values. I would propose a good exercise for all of us to do personally, and in fact what Christ is challenging us with in this gospel, is what are your core values? What are the things that you believe in for which you would be willing to sacrifice? Time, energy, finances, and ultimately, your life. What are things that are so important to you that they're ultimately more important than life itself? What were Christ's core values? Some of them we read in the gospel. Love for the poor, service to our neighbor, love for our brothers and sisters. What was his core enemies? Sin, slavery, whatever would limit the freedom of the human person. That's willing, I'm willing to die to eliminate that so that they're free to love me and the truth. What are our core values? It's actually a good exercise in family. What are your family's core values? What are the values you're trying to educate your children in? They're so important that we talk about them, that we organize discipline around them, that you get in trouble if you violate, right? What are those? In a relationship, what, are our core, what do we hold each other to? Because we love each other so much, and I want your good. This is really, I'm convinced, good for you. And we're both convinced it's good for us. And so we reckon these are our core values. We believe that Christ has revealed some of these core values in the gospel. And as Christians, that's why we're disciples of his. We follow those. We believe they're good for us. They're good for society. In fact, we believe they're ultimately the core values that at the final judgment will be the ones we're judged against. So they're kind of important to keep in our crosshairs, <laughs> in our, our view and our vision. But brothers and sisters, this isn't scary news. <laughs> this is great news. If we nail these, we're good. We're happy. We're flourishing. We're fulfilled. Not just us, but our children, society, others, right? Proposing and living in order in our life with discipline around these values, these truths, this person of Jesus Christ is joy, freedom, fulfillment, happiness, right? He'll say to us, well done, good and faithful servant, right? Come into the joy of your master. Come, receive the kingdom prepared for you. Right? Let's pray for, as we continue in this Mass then, that all of us would get clearer in our own prayer and reflection on what are those values that Christ revealed to us and that we hold as core and dear. Let's also pray that we would have the courage to order our choices in alignment with them out of love. Let's pray also our faith and our love increase in such that we are able to then make those, those choices because of the love that drives us. And ultimately, let us pray also for our government leaders, those who organize public society, ourselves included, but also those we elect to lead us in these same directions. Amen.